to the Philadelphia Convention, Mount Vernon, Annapolis, and James Madison's research project. In 1785, at the request of the legislatures of the two states, delegates from Virginia and Maryland met at Mount Vernon, George Washington's Potomac River estate. The general topic of the convention of the conference was how the Potomac River boundary between the two states would be shared. So questions such as licensing of pilots, uh, limiting or not limiting the uh, ports into which foreign ships could put, uh, tariff revenues and how they'd be divided were considered. Ultimately the conference did uh, reach agreement, but besides deciding how the Potomac would be shared, the delegates decided that they also had other questions of commerce that could not be decided between the two states, but that there needed to be a broader convention, a continental one, uh, with delegates from all the states. So they called for a continental convention to meet the following year at Annapolis, the first one having met in Virginia, the second one meet in Annapolis. The Annapolis Convention of 1786 was called with the purpose of resolving continental trade issues. And these were issues beyond simply the Potomac or even the Chesapeake Bay. The outcome of the convention uh, was limited. Five states delegates attended and several more states apparently had appointed delegates, some of whom were on the way to Annapolis when the convention broke up. Attendees at the Annapolis Convention included Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and Edmund Randolph of Virginia. These delegates drafted a resolution unanimously agreed to by the uh, delegates in attendance. It issued, uh, the convention issued, a call for a new convention the following summer in Philadelphia, quote, to devise such further provisions as shall appear to them necessary to render the constitution of the federal government adequate to the exigencies of the Union and to report such an act for that purpose to the United States and Congress assembled as when agreed to by them and afterwards confirmed by the legislatures of every state will effectually provide for the same. Or another way of putting that in non-legalese, non-18th century English is that the convention called for uh, the Congress to uh, call a convention the following year um, to um, draft amendments to the Articles of Confederation and uh, actually for the states, I should say, not the, not the Congress, to uh, call a convention for the following year to propose amendments to the Articles of Confederation. Notice the extra constitutionality of all this. This was not um, being done by any procedure that was contemplated by the Articles of Confederation. And in fact, four states had omitted to comply with the uh, Mount Vernon Conference's call altogether. So uh, what was really happening was that there was a kind of end run around established procedures being undertaken by some of the leading nationalists in American politics. When I use the word nationalists, of course, I'm distinguishing between them and federalists, lowercase f, federalists. Uh, a federalist is somebody who favors the idea of a, a central government with adequate powers to perform its limited functions. A nationalist, on the other hand, is someone who prefers a centralized model of government in which if there are uh, more local governmental institutions, they exist for the convenience of the center. And here, the experience of the war years and, and the three years since had led several prominent personages in American political life to the conclusion that what was really needed was a national government. That's what the Annapolis Convention's call was ultimately going to be converted into an attempt to make a national government. But notice again that it's extra constitutional. That is, uh, it was not being undertaken by the procedures for amendment to the Articles of Confederation that were contemplated by the Articles of Confederation. James Madison, one of the delegates in Annapolis who had been behind the nationalist call for uh, another convention the following year, undertook in the wake of the Annapolis Convention what one historian has called Jimmy Madison's research project. And what Madison did here was to uh, look into the history and theory of federal governments and the uh, experience of the United States under their federal system, the Articles of Confederation, and before that the Continental Congresses, 
to try to find common problems and common solutions to problems of federations. So there are a couple of fruits of this uh, research project, which Madison undertook with assistance from, among others, Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson actually off in France had access, which Madison didn't, to uh, numerous book vendors and so sent Madison uh, multiple crates of books on political philosophy, on ancient medieval and modern history, on the latest um, of uh, continental thinking about government. Madison's first uh, memorandum trying to summarize his learning was a memorandum regarding federations and here he wrote about three federations, two among the ancient Greeks and one in the Netherlands. Among the ancients he considered the experience of the Lycian Federation and the Amphictyonic uh, Federation and among the moderns the Belgic Federation and um, these memos, uh, this drafting process led Madison to a conclusion that uh, all through history federations had failed and the reason they ultimately failed was that inadequate power had been delegated to the central government. Now this sounds like a tautology, well if in the end confederated powers ceased to be confederated it must be because they didn't have power in the center to force them to remain confederated but in any event Madison concluded that federations in general had uh, not only come apart because the members decided they didn't want to be confederated but that the federal governments themselves had failed to live up to the uh, purposes for which the uh, establishing powers had set them up in the first place. Um, besides the fact that he wrote this memo on the uh, Lycian, Amphictyonic, and Belgic confederations, Madison also would make clear by his performance in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787 that he had spent time uh, researching the Swiss Confederation, the Holy Roman Empire, and other uh, federations that came to mind as well. So we can uh, get validation for this inference from his performance in Philadelphia from the reading list that he and the book buying list that he uh, sent to Jefferson. Jefferson uh, combed bookstores for information about, for example, the Holy Roman Empire's history, that is the German uh, more or less federation of the medieval and early modern periods. The second more momentous product of Madison's quote-unquote research project was a longer memorandum entitled Vices of the Federal System of the United States, which one editor of some of Madison's writings dates at April 1787. That, of course, is the month before the Philadelphia Convention met in May, so we can see again that Madison had undertaken this. Uh, project not gratuitously but in preparation for the Philadelphia Convention. The vices of the federal system of the United States is a, a subject that um, is a title that has been subject to a lot of uh, mirth because uh, or a lot of mockery I, maybe I could say because uh, Madison's personality was was reserved and proper and for all we know uh, Dolly Madison was the only serious woman in his life uh, with, barring one minor flirtation with a teenager when he was in his mid, early to mid thirties. So uh, the idea of Madison with vices is somewhat uh, amusing, but in any event, Madison's vices of the federal system, or I'm going to call it vices from here on, uh, laid out what he took to be the several areas in which the Articles of Confederation were an inadequate uh, federal government for the United States. The first was that the states, he said, ignored or failed to meet congressional requisitions. Now, under the Confederation, of course, the, the central government did not have power to raise an army directly. It didn't have a power to tax people. What it did was it calculated the numbers of men or, or dollars that it needed, and then it divided the number among the uh, states on the basis of their respective populations. So, for example, Connecticut which had one thirteenth of the population, by coincidence, um, of the uh, United States was expected to pay one thirteenth of the bill and provide one thirteenth of the soldiers and so on. So Madison said, and it was true, everybody knew that the states had either ignored or failed to meet congressional requisitions. Actually, the reasons for this are varied and uh, the just perversity of people's inclinations, uh, which was the uh, most common 
uh, explanation given by nationalists in the 1780s to explain um, why the federal government wasn't getting the men and money that it was asking for uh, is now downplayed among scholars. There's, there's actually an excellent book on this uh, collective action under the Articles of Confederation that shows that by any rational uh, uh, ex measure of uh, reasonable expectations, the states were actually providing at least as much as you might expect, in fact more. Um, but in any event, from the point of view of somebody who'd been in Congress like Madison, it was obvious that the states needed to be providing more men and money during the war and he thought the reason was that the government, that is the Constitution, was inadequate. A second of Madison's vices was that states tended to encroach on federal authority. And here what he meant was that they did things that um, by the articles should have been left to Congress to do. So for example, Georgia had repeatedly made treaties with neighboring Indians or Indians within its own territory. Now in theory, making treaties was a power of Congress. It was a power of the Confederation government, not of Georgia, but Georgia did it anyway. Georgia, Virginia had a compact with Maryland. Madison objected, which is of course somewhat amusing since he had not objected to the fact of the Mount Vernon Conference, but he uh, was not above then turning around and saying, look, the fact of the Mount Vernon Conference is proof that we need a new, uh, at least a radically strengthened central government. Pennsylvania had made a compact with New Jersey. Uh, troops had been raised by Massachusetts and were going to be maintained by Massachusetts. And this, of course, again, was contrary to the expectation of the Articles of Confederation that any professional soldiers would be in the employ of the Congress, not of the individual states. A third of Madison's vices was violations of the law of nations and of treaties. Now, um, these at the top of the list are all among the most significant. Of course, the states failing to meet requisitions meant that Congress didn't have money. Violations of the law of nations and of treaties could mean that the Brit British, the uh, French, or the Dutch would decide not to uh, comply with the conditions ending the war, or uh, in the case of the Dutch, that the Americans wouldn't be able to borrow money again in case they, as everybody expected, had further wars down the road. So uh, this was seen as a, a very distressing development. The fact that the French king had really put himself out in support of the American revolutionaries and now was not being paid his interest payments as promised uh, may or may not have irked uh, King Louis, but it certainly made uh, Federalists in America, that is to say uppercase F Federalists, proponents of strengthening the central government, made them very unhappy with their confederation. Of course, not complying with the Treaty of Paris, which had been a very good deal indeed for the United States, doubling, essentially doubling its size by giving it a western boundary at the Mississippi instead of at the Appalachians. Uh, this was foolhardy. And because the British still had, of course, substantial military assets north of the United States, and they also still had numbers of uh, thousands of troops on American territory at Detroit um, and uh, in western Pennsylvania. So people like Madison wanted the American states to comply with the treaty so that the Americans could enjoy the benefits of the treaty. Another of Madison's vices was that the states violated each other's rights, that they offended each other by issuing paper money, that they uh, were adopting tariff laws that put the burden of their own self-government on neighboring states that had to uh, import things through the ports of states with ports. Uh, uh, in general, they just disrespected um, each other and uh, for their own benefit, and Madison thought, well, of course, if there were an adequate central government, the central government could disallow this kind of behavior. If there were an adequate central government, we wouldn't have to worry about this kind of problem. And uh, we wouldn't have to have a situation in which um, ultimately uh, Virginia and Pennsylvania came to blows in the western part of what is now Pennsylvania over the question where the boundary was between the two states. Madison also uh, listed among his vices of the federal system that uh, the states had not been able to engaged jointly in establishing colleges or, or setting up uh, networks of uh, roads and canals or setting out an American copyright uh, law. In other words, they had not been able to do much of anything that would have required interstate cooperation. This, Madison thought, was because the, um, the Confederation did not 
empower the Congress to undertake these measures, which he thought uh, were almost certain to benefit multiple states, if not all the states. So this is another one of what he saw as a shortcoming of the Articles of Confederation. Various uh, observations had led to the vices of the federal system. Of course, to a large extent, these two memoranda, the one on uh, ancient, medieval, and modern confederacies, and the one on the vices of the federal system were based on book learning, but besides that, Madison was drawing on his own knowledge, and this is very clear when it comes to the vice that uh, the states had been unable to guarantee each other's Republican forms of government, and the, the Confederation obviously had been uh, unable to guarantee the states' Republican forms of government. Never had that been clearer than it was in 1786, just a few months before uh, Madison finished this project, when uh, Massachusetts was riven by a tax revolt known as Shays Rebellion. Then uh, farmers in western Massachusetts, nominally headed by Daniel Shays, a, uh, a, a, continental, a former Continental Army captain, but uh, seemingly in actuality headed by a militia colonel, at least one militia colonel, that is, one prominent citizen of western Pennsylvania, of western Massachusetts, um, had undertaken to resist enforcement of the state's taxes. And what they had done was to embody themselves essentially as a military unit and prevent tax collectors from collecting taxes. And they then burned down courthouses and otherwise made it impossible for uh, normal governmental functions to be carried out in their part of the Bay State. Ultimately, what had happened was that the uh, eastern Massachusetts government had sent large militia uh, forces out into the west to put down this revolt. People fled into Connecticut and, and into uh, Vermont from western Massachusetts. So the people like Madison looked on aghast and thought that, again, if there were an adequate central government, what ought to happen is that the government ought to intervene and prevent the rebels from thwarting the will of the uh, Republican majority. I mean, the fact that old rebels like Sam Adams were saying things such as that there could be no valid excuse for resisting the duly enacted laws of Republican government showed that there was a kind of consensus across the United States uh, on behalf or on the side of the Massachusetts authorities against Shays rebels and uh, as far as Madison was concerned, again, if there were an adequate central government, it would have been, a would have been able to intervene in Massachusetts and help put down Shays' Rebellion. And this gets to the next of his vices, essentially the lack of enforcement power. It wasn't only that the federal uh, government under the Confederation couldn't intervene in the states to put down rebellion. It, it couldn't do anything to ensure that its requisitions of men and money were actually met by the states. It just essentially was begging the states for men and money. And Madison thought this was not government. In fact, he referred to this feature of the system as imbecility. Imbecility not referring to the lack of, of sense or intellect, but just to the kind of innervation, the inability to do anything. What was that based on? Well, it was based partly on what he pointed to in his next vice, absence of popular ratification. This federal system had been agreed to by the state legislatures. And Madison believed that if the people themselves had spoken on this question, if there had been some mechanism for enlisting the entire people's opinion of the federal constitution, that it would have had more moral authority than it had uh, just with the imprimatur of the state legislatures. So he believed that, it's, that any replacement or any perfection of uh, or at least improvement of the federal constitution ought to include uh, a process of popular ratification. Madison pointed as another flaw in the federal system what he called, quote, multiplicity of laws in the several states. And here what had happened was that newly republicanized state governments had gone on a bender, just adopting laws one after another, and often from one session to the next. Remember, most legislators had one-year sessions during the revolution. In Rhode Island, the terms were six months, um, from one session to the next, changing laws before they were even implemented. Madison says this is a horrible development, and it could be avoided if there were more power in the central government, if more significant uh, governmental questions were decided 
not on the local level by people who are elected to extremely short terms by extremely small districts of people, uh, but instead you had a more distant government that was made up of people who were elected on on a longer term basis by people from longer districts. You'd end up with a better quality of people in those seats, and he thought you'd end up with a better quality of product from the legislative process. This was in, related to frequent changes to and profusion, profusion of state statutes. Frequent changes to and profusion of state statutes. It would be hard to overstate the extent to which this was a phenomenon that characterized the period of the American Revolution and immediately after uh, the period when Madison was writing. Some, some historians have called this, as, as one Federalist did, the critical period in American history, the critical period. Why was it critical? Well, the of course, the Federalist narrative said that the Republican experiment in America was about to fail. And we might think, well, there's a, there's a good helping of propaganda in this characterization. Uh, it's obviously on the part of people who wanted to transfer a lot of power from uh, local legislators to a more distant Congress. But uh, on the other hand, there was frequent uh, change to and profusion of state statutes in this period. And uh, Madison rightly identified this as a vice of the system. He also pointed to, quote, injustice of the laws of the states. Injustice of the laws of the states. Well, what did that have to do with? It had to do, among other things, with treatment of minorities. And the minority who came to mind for Federalists who wanted to change the Articles of Confederation were moneyed people, lenders, people who were able to provide people with credit. And there had been a multiplicity of laws, laws adopted in every state, like stay laws, saying we'll have a moratorium on foreclosures, for example, and paper money laws saying that the highly inflated currency that was being produced by the state legislatures and by the Congress had to be accepted. And, and all of these laws amounted to simply transferring wealth from one group to another, from creditors to debtors, or not coincidentally from a minority of the population to the majority of the population. And later, John C. Calhoun would say that the, the great uh, difficulty that had been identified in American uh, political practice was that you had two parties, essentially, the people who received tax money and the people who paid taxes. And um, this problem had already been identified by Madison uh, essentially in talking about or in thinking about the way the federal system and state governments were working. He thought one way to avoid this problem, or at least ameliorate it a bit, was by what he called, quote, an enlargement of the sphere, an enlargement of the sphere of Republican government. So if you had, what he meant was that if you had Republican government in a small area, then you ended up with a certain kind of product. Right? You ended up with people who were neighbors and who were homogeneous, and it was easy to identify a majority, and then it was easy for a majority to mobilize its own political power within the state legislature against minorities, even if the interest of the um, minority were just, and even if the uh, program of the majority were unjust, it was easy for this kind of thing to be done. And especially these state laws and paper money laws seem to illustrate that, that. Those kinds of laws were adopted in every single state. And Madison was certain they were unjust, besides uh, ultimately counterproductive for the whole society. So he thought if you had an enlargement of the sphere, you would make it, that is, if you took in uh, more territory, more ethnic groups, more religious persuasions, and so on, you'd make it more difficult for a majority to, to form. And then once it had uh, potentially uh, come to exist, it would make it more difficult for people to organize it and use it uh, to control politics. So. Ultimately, of course, he's going to use this phrase in describing the same idea in his mortal contribution to the Federalist, Federalist Number 10, where he, he calls it an extension of the sphere. But it's the same idea. Basically, what it amounts to is a, a justification for or a motive for transferring some governmental authority from state legislatures to a national one. And that was, of course, what Madison was going ultimately to stand for.